Hello and welcome. You've tuned into Arirang's Within the Frame. I'm Handan in Seoul. North Korea is continuing to build up its belligerence and hostility toward South Korea and the U.S. After resuming its missile provocations, leader Kim Jong-un declared an early completion of the state's five-year plan to develop strategic weapons. That's as South Korea welcomed top U.S. diplomat Antony Blinken and high-level officials from some 30 countries hosting the Summit for Democracy. For an in-depth analysis, of North Korea's latest moves, we now invite Ko Myung-hyun, a senior research fellow at the Institute for National Security Strategy, to the studio. It's great to have you back. Nice to be here. We also have Mark Berry, associate editor emeritus at the International Journal on World Peace, joining us from New York. Welcome to the program. Yes, yeah, nice to be back with you both. Good to see you. All right, Dr. Go, let's start with you. Kim Jong-un has declared mm. that North Korea's five-year mm. plan to develop strategic weapons is now mm. complete. What type of weapons are we talking here and how concerned are mm. you about this? So this is essentially the, the list of new weapons that North Korea promised to develop back in uh, the Eighth Party Congress in 2021. So that was in January 2021, now it's uh, March 2024. So essentially, Kim Jong-un has declared that uh, their Air uh, development plan has been completed ahead of schedule. And if it's, in fact, if it's indeed true, it's an impressive feat because what they promised back then it really included really a wide-ranging uh, uh, types of missile, I mean, uh, weapon systems, including very sophisticated uh, uh, systems such as intercontinental ballistic missile that has a uh, solid fuel rocket engine. And so had North Korea developed such a system from scratch back in 2021 and completed the development by now in three years time, that would have been a world record in many ways. But uh, it wasn't just a, a solid fuel rocket engine ballistic missile, but it also included a uh, nuclear submarine, but in this case, not, not a submarine that's a nuclear propulsion, but essentially a submarine that can launch, theoretically speaking, a uh, nuclear-tipped ballistic missile. This is a um, submarine that, that they unveiled the uh, summer of last year. And it also includes uh, military spy satellite, the Malignan one that uh, they put in orbit last year as well. And then it also includes uh, um, UAVs and other types of ballistic missiles, uh, undersea uh, uh, or uh, unmanned uh, nuclear uh, drone. And wow, well, what am I missing now? So there are so many. So uh, I think uh, what North Koreans are saying here is in a way uh, it's keeping in, uh, in line with uh, what North Korean used to do in terms of achieving uh, government plan of developing something, whether that's in economic domain or military domain or social domain. They always assign a goal, uh, usually in five years' time, and they, they always also announce that, that they are meeting those goals ahead of the schedule. So they are essentially keeping with uh, those historical patterns of uh, the so-called five-year plans. Uh, but what's really most likely that has happened isn't that the North Korea has achieved its goals ahead of schedule, it's that they have completed these developments already well before they even announced uh, the such development, uh, that there was a such a developmental roadmap. And they are using this as a political process of to essentially to aggrandize the North Korea in the eyes of the international community and also increase uh, potential negotiation leverage vis-a-vis -vis other countries, especially with the United States, that the North Korea possesses uh, incredible technological and industrial capabilities, which are likely to be exaggerated. And that's the whole point. This is another form of North Korea's political posturing. So some of the, the strategic mm. weapons that we're talking here include uh, solid fuel engine propelled new ICBMs mm. and uh, some type of nuclear powered submarine. Mm. Which is not uh, nuclear power, it's a submarine with a conventional power, but that carries uh, nuclear tip missiles. And also uh, the, uh, the reconnaissance satellite. Mm. And like you said, it would be a world record if North Korea really did uh, develop uh, this huge range of weapons in such a short span of time. Exactly. But you've mentioned that they probably have been developing mm. 
for uh, these weapons uh, from long before. Yep. Uh, now to you, Dr. Barry. Kim Jong-un, meanwhile, was quick to congratulate Russian President Vladimir Putin on his re-election. Kim said that he will, quote unquote, firmly join hands with Putin to meet the demands of the times and to provide a new turning point for the Russia DPRK friendship. How do you anticipate the trajectory of the two countries' relations unfolding from this point on? Well, the way I see uh, the DPRK-Russia relationship is that it's a temporary measure by Kim Jong-un to offset uh, China or President Xi's enormous pressure to conform to China's policies, both foreign and domestic. So Kim's now using Russia and its need for uh, the North surplus but aging munitions to counterbalance China and avoid an increasing and embarrassing dependency on China. So although it's selling arms uh, to Russia may be temporarily helpful to the North's economy, when Kim is no longer useful to Putin, uh, the trade in munitions for technical assistance, for food, for other goods, in my view, will cease, and Putin will effectively throw uh, Kim Jong-un under the bus. And uh, to kind of paraphrase Putin when he spoke of Navalny's death uh, two days ago, he said, uh, there's nothing you can do about it. It's life. So I think uh, Kim will uh, just simply become refuse down the road uh, in a year or two's time. Uh, but that said, I do anticipate maybe in the second half of this year that Putin will visit uh, uh, North Korea after he uh, sees uh, President Xi in May. But uh, this is an expediency uh, arrangement, uh, and that's it. Uh, and uh, in the end, uh, the usefulness uh, for North Korea, uh, excuse me, uh, of North Korea for Russia will be extremely limited. And I think it'll be proven over the next year or two. I think you've highlighted two very interesting points here that um, North Korea is using Russia uh, to ease pressure from China and that President Putin will probably throw Kim Jong-un under the bus uh, once he's no longer useful. Now, staying with you, Dr. Barry, North Korea has been placed under stifling sanctions for years, but the latest report suggests that the pressure on the North is weakening. We saw a Kim receive a luxury car from Putin in a blunt violation of sanctions. Uh, we're also seeing the sanctions busting sending of North Korean workers overseas, uh, not to mention its trade with China and its long list of illicit cyber activities. How do you assess the current state of sanctions on the North? I should comment on that uh, Russian limousine, uh, which is that uh, if, uh, if I were Kim Jong-un, I'd have my experts go through the vehicle and remove all of the uh, vehicle tracking and eavesdropping devices that that's Putin put That's in actually there. exactly what I thought, too. Yeah, I, and it's, uh, uh, you know, but I mean, let's give the Russians credit. Uh, they no longer make the Zill limousine, but they now make this uh, uh, Sanat limousine, and maybe it's a little better. But the bottom line is that 2024 is not 2017. And... Uh, uh, and in 2017, Russia and China, uh, during the Trump presidency, uh, joined the U.S. in actively supporting uh, U.N. sanctions. But now they're uh, ignoring sanctions enforcement under President Biden and for, for their own reasons. But at the same time, the U.S. has never seriously gone after the real sources of sanctions evasion, which is China's banks. Uh, I mean, that, that banking system in China uh, is uh, more guilty of uh, sustenance of the North Korean regime than anything else. And uh, unilaterally, the U.S. can make it extremely difficult uh, for the, the, those banks to use the dollar to do what they do, but the U.S. won't do that. And this has been pointed out time and time again by sanctions specialists in the private sector like Joshua Stanton. Uh, but levying sanctions and vigorous sanctions enforcement are two entirely different matters. Uh, and moreover, I would say sanctions is not a policy. If it doesn't spur diplomacy and negotiation, then sanctions are not an effective tool. And Russia and China know um, that, uh, know that, and they have argued for decades, and I think rightly so, despite the, the tensions today, that um, the U.S. needs to engage in real diplomacy with North Korea and take into account that the North has legitimate interests. So in that sense, they've not been wrong, but uh, the, they are no longer playing the sanctions game because it just is not uh, beneficial to them at this time. 
Uh, so sanctions, if they don't induce dialogue, then the, it's not an effective tool. I think that point uh, speaks volumes. Now, Dr. Go, the possibility of Kim Jong-un's daughter, Chue, being the heir apparent is brewing once again. Mm -hmm. As uh, the Korean Central News Agency called her, along with her father, the quote-unquote great persons of guidance using the Korean word hyangdo. Mm -hmm. And uh, Seoul's unification ministry says that uh, she may, she mm. could be become uh, Kim's successor. Mm. Explain to us uh, the term hyangdo and how significant is this new labeling of chue? So hyangdo, uh, I mean, it's not a commonly used term uh, in the South Korea list. And uh, hyangdo in this case uh, means probably, you know, overall, significance of it. There's no exact translation, but then if you interpret the terms that are included in this, uh, uh, in this expression, it will indicate that this is a way of uh, showing directions. So um, essentially this is the idea that the person that does hyangdo is actually directing uh, the country towards a better a pathway towards the future. So, no, the end, the end destination is not implied here, but then essentially uh, its implication is about leadership and leading and then directing. So, which is an appropriate term to be used uh, on a potential success to, to, to Kim Jong-un, who's the leader of North Korea, again, leading. Uh, so, I think the reason why North Koreans are using this complicated term to uh, imply that the Jue could be uh, a potential success to Kim Jong-un, exactly that, to insinuate that there's a potential for succession. And the reason why North Koreans are not making this clear, it clearly due to the age of Jue. She's only 10 years old, or perhaps 11, still very young, and then, uh, so she hasn't really demonstrated a full capability that she can lead anything. So I think uh, what North Koreans are doing is essentially raising the awareness our presence uh, in the North Korean society. And this is very much needed to, do, to be done right now. Uh, if indeed Kim Jong-un is planning to make Jue uh, his official successor, and if uh, Jue indeed becomes the leader of North Korea, it will be the first time that uh, North Korea appoints a female leader. And uh, I don't think the North Korean people are used to that idea yet. Uh, perhaps because North Korea is a very chauvinist society, and you know, so uh, it's very hierarchical. And oftentimes in societies like this, uh, uh, the women actually take the back seat. And now somehow Kijue uh, will be could be a female leader. And if that's indeed what's in the plans, then Kim Jong Un will do a lot of uh, prep work before this indeed takes place. And the sooner the better. And that's why maybe uh, Kim Jong-un is investing so much uh, in making Jue look uh, more like a leader-like, even though she's, uh, you know, a pretty age of 11 right now. Uh, but then on the other hand, I think that she faces a lot of challenges going ahead. And this imposes a lot of uncertainty about the actual prospect of she being, uh, becoming leader of North Korea anytime soon. And also, we also uh, speculate that Kim Jong-un has uh, other uh, uh, children of springs, uh, some of them are probably uh, boys, and they, they places them in a better position to succeed Kim Jong-un later on. And so we don't know what's going to happen in five years' time when both Kim Jue and then her uh, siblings, uh, male siblings, grow up and then they change their attitude, uh, personalities, maybe even like the, the appearances, and that could uh, change the uh, the prospect of Kim Jue's uh, succession, uh, maybe negatively instead of being positive. Uh, so we have to wait and see in this case. As you've alluded to, Kim Jue is just an elementary school kid, mm. right? So it will probably be decades uh, mm. until the world finds out who the real successor is. But mm. uh, it surely is attention grabbing how Kim Jong-un is parading mm. uh, Kim Jue around major mm. political events. Uh, now, meanwhile, Dr. Barry, calls appear to be growing for the U.S. to find a new North Korea strategy with many experts acknowledging the fact that the North is unlikely to give up its nuclear program, already having reached the stage where it can be considered a de facto nuclear state. Now, experts suggest Washington should seek a breakthrough by using Pyongyang's economic woes as leverage. We want to get your thoughts on this. Well, I applaud uh, Yonsei Professor John Delury's New York Times op-ed on Saturday, uh, suggesting that the Biden uh, administration 
uh, it's not too late to try diplomacy. But when Tony Blinken was in Seoul the other day, uh, he again told uh, Foreign Minister Cho uh, that uh, we're solidly aligned for the denuclearization of North Korea. So the policy hasn't really changed. And if a, a junior National Security Council official or a mid-range uh, State Department official in the EAP uh, department uh, is talking about maybe some step-by-step uh, -step measures. Uh, I think they're just trying to take the pressure off. I mean, the, the world is kind of wild and crazy right now, and the number one thing on Tony Blinken's mind is dealing with Israel and Gaza uh, and the possibility of a wider outbreak of war, particularly in Israel's north. So I, I, I tend to agree with Bob Carlin and Sig Hecker who uh, on January 11th uh, wrote, and also kind of seconded by uh, Ambassador Robert Gallucci, that Kim Jong-un has decisively given up on improving our relations with the U.S. after 34 years uh, of the Kim dynasty attempting to do so. And in that sense, it won't matter who is president. Uh, and uh, furthermore, your question about uh, the possibility of pressuring China to pressure North Korea, well, that's only going to backfire. Uh, right now, U.S.-China relations are so poor that pressuring China, rather than uh, proverbially seeking its assistance, which is used to be happy to, to say they would, would attempt to do, but we don't know how much influence we have on the North, uh, nonetheless, it's going to uh, rub salt in the wound as far as China is concerned. So the larger picture is that Washington, in my view, uh, would like to separate China from Russia so that China sees its future more tied in the international system to include the U.S. And this is a very delicate dance. It's almost like we have to see Biden perform a, uh, a Nixon part two, where he tries to separate China from Russia, because we don't want to see the two get closer together. And they have two totally different interests. China has tremendous resentment against Russia historically for uh, taking over or conquering millions of square miles of Chinese territory since the 1900s. Now, staying with you, Dr. Barry, the rematch between Biden and Trump is now official, and some experts uh, say that Kim Jong-un will be hoping uh, for Trump's return so he can have another go at uh, negotiating with uh, Trump himself. But uh, you argue otherwise. Tell us a little bit about this. To his credit, President Trump was the first sitting uh, not former, U.S. president to meet with a North Korean leader. But he's also the person who led Kim Jong-un to conclude that based on the failed uh, Hanoi summit and its aftermath in 2019, that the U.S. overall was not good for its word. And so I believe Kim's concluded that the U.S. Uh, is just another imperialist power, not more benign than Russia and China and Japan in the historical past of, of Korea. Uh, and um, basically that the U.S. Uh, manipulates North Korea uh, just like any other major power has done. So uh, a Trump re-election, despite uh, 27 previous love letters, uh, will not cause Kim to soften his view of the U.S. or of Trump. So uh, I very strongly believe that uh, Trump cannot, excuse me, that Kim believes that Trump cannot keep his word. And if Trump's reelected, Kim uh, is very unlikely to respond to his overtures. Uh, moreover, uh, you know, since December, Kim has disavowed uh, eventual reunification with South Korea. And that's a major sea change uh, on the Korean Peninsula. And it places major obstacles in renewing U.S. DPRK dialogue, even if it were ever to occur. And finally, I should add, uh, being here in the New York area, is that Trump has to get past next Monday to have a future uh, in the electoral process because he owes nearly half a billion dollars in cash bond from his civil fraud judgment in New York State. And if he can meet it, that could have a, an extremely damaging, cascading effect on his entire re-election effort. So although he may become a candidate officially and formally in, in July, he may be very, very hobbled, and it may be actually quite premature here in March of 2024 to even see uh, that it'll be uh, quite as close as an election with any likelihood of Trump uh, being reelected uh, than, than we had previously thought. Now, Dr. Gold, North Korea is preparing to mm. replace its ambassador to Cuba, 
Batolsu after Cuba's surprise establishment of diplomatic ties with mm. South Korea. Uh, Ma recently paid a visit to Cuban President Miguel Diaz Canal before concluding mm. his mission. How do you see this, and what lies ahead for North Korea Cuba relations? No, I think the uh, the departure of the current uh, North Korean ambassador to Cuba has been amicable. I don't think there's any sign of a strain between North Korea and Cuba, despite what happened. Uh, I mean, I think uh, the sole expectation that uh, the normalization of the relations between Seoul and North Korea, uh, sorry, Seoul and Cuba could potentially lead to rapture in the long-standing relationship between Pyongyang and Havana uh, probably was uh, exaggerated a little bit. And I think uh, when Cuba decided to normalize relations with South Korea, it's very likely that he has informed about this, such a decision to Pyongyang beforehand to gain Pyongyang's understanding. And clearly North Korea wasn't probably too happy about it. But then yeah, they probably consider that uh, Cuba is a very important country for North Korea. It is given the fact that North Korea is very isolated internationally, except for which a uh, growing uh, rapprochement with Moscow. So I think all things considered, North Korea decided to accept the changes in status quo. And I think uh, the North Korea-Cuba relations could continue amicably uh, into the future. Dr. Barry, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, you know, in 1991, uh, the NGO I was with um, was trying to um, make a trip uh, uh, because the head of it was the former president of Costa Rica, uh, Rodrigo Carrasso. And uh, he and my colleague uh, decided uh, to go together in May of 1991. And uh, President Carrasso went to the uh, North Korean embassy in Managua, uh, applied for a visa. And what the North Koreans in Managua, Nicaragua did is they contacted Cuban intelligence. And uh, Cuban intelligence uh, vouched for President Carrasso, and they had to go all the way to Fidel Castro to get his imprimatur uh, on President Carrasso so that Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il would know the caliber of this man. And that led to uh, um, not only a, a visit with the number three leader in North Korea in 91, but to uh, meetings with both uh, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-un in 1992 and with Kim Il-sung in 1994 uh, on a delegation that I accompanied his staff. So the relationship between North Korea and Cuba is astoundingly good. It's better than with Vietnam. It's better than with any of the Eastern European countries. And frankly, I'd say it's even better than with Russia and China. It's an extraordinarily good relationship. And anything going on in the Western Hemisphere, the Cubans know about it. So there are a tremendous ally, and the difference between 91 and today is that the U.S. does have diplomatic relations with Cuba. It's only that the Trump administration made it more restrictive without breaking the diplomatic relations. But with President Yoon opening up diplomatic uh, ties with uh, Cuba, I think was an extraordinarily fortuitous step, and there could be a lot more benefit out of it than we realize. And I and I think this is something one of the brighter spots on the on the, on an otherwise somewhat dim horizon. Well, it'll be uh, interesting to see how the two Koreas further develop their uh, respective relationship with Cuba from this point on. The two Koreas now stand at a critical juncture with a significant changes being uh, witnessed across various domains. Uh, a very timely and insightful discussion we had today. Thank you so much, Dr. Go and Dr. Barry, for your perspectives. Thank you very much. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you for watching and be sure to tune in same time tomorrow to join our conversation. Goodbye for now.